Welcome back to the Halftime Report. I want to remind you once again, Facebook COO Cheryl Sandberg speaks exclusively to our Julia Borston. That is today, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, her first interview since the news broke that a political firm obtained the data of 50 million Facebook users. That is today, 4 p.m. Eastern, and that's only on CNBC. The fallout from the data scandal continuing to drag Facebook shares lower this hour. CEO Mark Zuckerberg breaking his silence about the incident last night. This was a major breach of trust, and, and I'm really sorry that this happened. Um, you know, we have a basic responsibility to protect people's data, and if we can't do that, then, then we don't uh, deserve to have the opportunity to serve people. Our next guest co-founded the company that would go on to become Facebook, while a Harvard classmate of Mark Zuckerberg, Divya Narendra, is now the CEO of Sum Zero, joins us live here at Post 9. It's a CNBC exclusive interview. It's good to see you again. Good to see you. So you heard the apology. Yep. What'd you make of it? Um, I thought he did a good job of being pretty direct about answering, you know, all the questions. He, um, you know, this is obviously a very complicated issue, and I think it's worth people taking a step back to appreciate um, sort of the scale of the problem. You know, when you look at Facebook, you're talking about a company that has two billion users across, across the globe, um, and policing every aspect of that community is actually really hard. And I think one of the things that Mark didn't say um, is that Facebook should be a neutral platform, right? We don't want to build a, a, a community where um, people don't feel like, they don't feel comfortable expressing opinions but I think what their responsibility is and should be is to kind of maintain some standards for veracity throughout the platform. That's both in terms of its advertiser base, but also, um, you know, also the, 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 the community itself. Um, and that's really hard to do. Um, and, you know, when you look at the timeline of the events here, which I think is, is also important, um, you know, getting to Cambridge Analytica, their access to the app dates back to 2013, not long after Facebook actually went public. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think what, what I took away from kind of the interview is, A, I think Mark has a genuine desire to solve the problem um, and acknowledges the fact that it's not something that can be solved 100%, um, just given the, you know, I think um, the nature of bad actors and, 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 and some of the concerns of, um, you know, just the scale of the community. It's just, it's a hard thing to solve. Uh, but it sounds like they're taking concrete steps. Um, and it sounds like he has a genuine interest um, both a moral interest, but also, for obvious reasons, an economic interest in sure. solving this problem. Do you think he waited too long to speak out? No, I think that's crazy. Um, you, you know, from what I read, Mark actually found out about this entire incident almost through the press itself, um, and very recently. So when you think about your CEO, words actually matter. You have to be careful about what you say, and I think um, taking the extra time to assess what the facts actually are it's a much better attack than simply getting out there and just making statements without even knowing what had actually transpired. And I think the other thing that he said, and, and um, you know, this is uh, obviously something that, that will be followed up on, is that they still don't know exactly what happened. There's a lot of, I think, uh, uncertainty as to, you know, what did Cambridge Analytica really do with this data? Was it effective at all in terms of, uh, you know, um, controlling the emotions of some of, uh, of Facebook users to that, in a way that may have swayed their votes. I mean, there's, there's a long chain of logic from, you know, accessing this data to swaying an election, and you have to kind of buy into all of, you know, that, that very long chain to, to come to the conclusion that, you know, Facebook is somehow responsible for the, the you know, the, the deeds of a consulting firm. You don't think they were asleep at the switch, that they waited too they, long? I, I think they may have been, but... To, um, to assess what had happened, yeah. or even to check up on this data to make sure that, in fact, it was destroyed? Well, from what I understand, um, they had an agreement with the, uh, the, the academic himself, um, uh, Kogan, uh, Alexander Kogan, to, to make sure that um, the data wasn't used for commercial purposes, and it was. Now, if it turns out that, in, in actuality, like, um, you know, uh, they did get permission to Alex to, to, to Kogan to go and use that data for commercial purposes or just sell it to a consulting firm, it's a very different story, and I think that's a pretty serious offense. Um, but just kind of taking it on its face, it sounds like they were duped more than anything. Um, and I can see how in 2013 that could have happened, uh, just given all their other priorities. And we I mean, also kind of look at this situation. Nobody was even talking about um, 
you know, like privacy and, and, and data protection and all these issues until after the election, until after Trump got, got elected. So, um, you know, I could easily see a scenario where to them it wasn't as big a priority then as it is now. Um, but hopefully they'll, they'll kind of take tangible steps to, to solve what the problem. You, what do you think Sheryl Sandberg needs to say today when she sits down exclusively on CNBC? You heard from the founder. He has a, obviously a unique perspective unto himself. Sheryl Sandberg has an opportunity to speak to investors in, sure. a, in a way. What's the yeah, message yeah, yeah. today? Um, well, I think, I think where people criticize Mark specifically is his, maybe his tone, the way he comes across. Um, some people have labeled him as robotic or maybe a little bit mechanical. Um, and for a lot of, I think, folks who listen to him, it's hard to connect with that type of personality. I think Cheryl, hopefully, will maybe um, resonate in, in, in more of a, an emotional way um, with uh, both investors and also just kind of members of Facebook, uh, which, is, which is a hard thing to do. Um, but I think, you know, she you know, maybe can do that. And also just reiterate what they're actually doing to solve the problem in the long run. Um, this is not the type of uh, problem, I mean, this is espionage 2.0. It's not gonna get solved overnight, uh, you know, by anyone. But I think Facebook's better resource to do that, uh, to kind of create the solutions that are necessary than anyone else in the industry. And I think it just needs time to kind of implement those how, changes. All that said, how much lasting damage do you think has been done to the brand itself? Um, it's very hard to say. I mean, if you look at what happened with Uber, uh, the whole Travis Kalanick debacle, um, you know, it sounds like, it seems like they've been making good steps to kind of improve the brand uh, and make sure that people continue to use Uber, um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, it's utility, right? If you want to connect with people around the globe, um, in a way, Facebook is kind of the way in which to do that. Uh, there's no other app or collection of apps that connects as many people um, in the way that Facebook does. I don't, you don't think I people don't think will disengage? Engage. I mean, you don't, this, this whole, um, you know, hashtag delete Facebook movement yeah. that's out there. In the interview, you know, last night, Zuckerberg said, well, we don't, we haven't seen uh, that in, in great amounts to, to this point. Do I you think, think if, we will? I think if Facebook continues to innovate its kind of core products, continues to be sort of focused on its product initiatives, AI, making it easier for people to connect around the globe, um, then in the long run, no, I think they'll continue to be like the dominant network um, as they have been. Um, it's just that in the press, you oftentimes see that people who feel aggrieved tend to be the most outspoken. Um, I do think it'll pass, but it's just one of these things where, you know, it, it, it turns into a firestorm very quickly, and that's just kind of the nature of media. I mean, one article leads to another, leads to another, and before you know it, uh, you know, you have people sounding alarms in a very short amount of time before the company's even had, a t had time to process what they need to do to, to, to kind of keep the business moving forward. I know you know uh, who Roger McNamee is. Uh, sure. Roger was on CNBC earlier today. I want you to listen to what uh, he sure. said about the stock, and then we can react on the other side. Here's Roger McNamee. Well, I've trimmed a bunch of it because, especially this week, because it just, I, I don't think they get it. I don't think they get it. I mean, this comes from an early Facebook investor who also told me, and I'm quoting here, we talked after this interview, that they've shown a callous disregard for the privacy and security of their user data, that Zuckerberg thought Facebook could grow huge without growing up. What's your response to that? I don't know where he gets that from. Um, you know, Roger, I don't know him personally, but he tends to make pretty dramatic comments when I have seen his interviews on television. Um, you know, a lot of folks, like, I don't know if, if he has any sort of axe to grind or, or whatever, but, um, y you know, like, this is a company that's very young. It's definitely um, got a lot of growth ahead of it. I think for folks who are thinking about it financially as an investment, um, here, this is a company that you can buy for 20 times earnings, even less, arguably, depending upon what your view is on earnings. Um, trading it, it, with, despite 50% growth and then this massive portfolio of unmonetized assets. So I think what's interesting about Facebook that a lot of people also don't realize is that historically they've actually been pretty slow about monetizing, right? Like they tend to wait to grow the community out um, and in, in, in their case grow communities out into the hundreds of millions in size or a billion plus in size before they actually decide to monetize. Um, and I think it shows that they understand 
community engagement maybe better than most. Um, you know, it's, it's they could have easily have extracted more dollars out of Facebook earlier than they actually did, but I think I think they've shown actually the opposite mo, which is let's be patient about growing the community, let's get the strategy right, um, and let's monetize it in the correct way. And for them. It's through an advertising model, right? At the end of the day, you don't pay for Facebook. Like, you have free access to the platform. Um, I think it's fair for businesses, not just them, but any internet business, to be able to leverage an advertising model. Um, they just have to be transparent about how they're doing so. Well, do you think, though, to Roger's point, um, as the company has grown bigger and bigger, do you think they've shown enough regard for the data that they collect from their users? Um, I think so. It's. I think it's very much like a. It, it's somewhat subjective at this point because, um, you know, again, I, I just come back to the scale of the business, the fact that, um, you know, they're not actually making that much money per user. If you think about it, if a company that's doing forty billion dollars a year in sales with two billion users, twenty bucks a year. So, you know, how does that? How do you weigh that? I mean, I think if you were given a service where you're able to connect with friends and family around the globe. And then I told you that, oh, this company is going to earn 20 bucks a year off you. It sounds actually pretty reasonable. Um, and, you know, look, like, I don't know how many people have read their terms of use, but it's not crazy if you actually go through some of the details. And when you think about the profile information that they're working with, um, it's likes and dislikes. It's, you know, it's, it's maybe your age, things like that. Um, you know, it's not your, it's not your credit card info or, or, or some, of the, some, of the, some of the data that other companies have access to that people don't even talk about. Um, so I think, look, I mean, ultimately the question of data protection has to, comes down to, like, do you believe that management has an incentive to guard user data? Is that incentive, um, you know, exemplified in the way they communicate? And I think they actually did a pretty good job of, like, taking the time to sort out what had happened react accordingly um, in a measured way, not in, a, not in a rushed way. I thought it was very interesting, yeah. though, but in the interview where, you know, Zuckerberg, as, as you talk about what needs to happen next, yeah. can Facebook police itself, yeah. which some doubt that, that they can, even he said, I don't see why we, maybe we should not be. Yeah, so this regulated. gets to the regulation question, and I think, I think the issue there is striking the right balance, right? Like, um, should they be regulated? I don't have a strong view on it. I mean, I think I think just the economic forces alone will force them to, to make the types of changes that they're making now, and, and frankly, at a greater pace. And actually, one of the most interesting things I saw was that, you know, him making the comment that we've hired 15,000 people to focus on security, um, that's an astonishing number when you think about the total employee base of Facebook, right? I mean, that could be a third or more of Facebook's entire employee base. Um, you know, does Boeing and Raytheon have that many folks focused on security? Does JP Morgan have that many folks focused on security? Um, I think just the investments alone that they're making in terms of their staff uh, says a lot. It sort of speaks for itself. Um, whether it works or not will obviously take time. Are there any doubts in your mind that he's the guy to run this company? No, I think for, you know, having a business like this that's a technology leader, you want somebody who is um, very close to tech, uh, very close to the product, which as the founder, like he very much is so. Um, someone who's close to engineering and understands kind of the, the challenges involved with, um, you know, building products that can achieve scale. Uh, and, and no, I mean, I think this is also a company that he's grown from a very, I mean, we're talking about a company that achieved a $500 billion market cap in a very short amount of time. So when I see these reports about people calling, you know, Mark to resign, I mean, it's just bananas to me. Like, you, you listen to these reports, it's like, wow, like, who is this person making these kinds of, you know, like, claims? And they make for good headlines, uh, but they're just totally disconnected from the reality, which is, like, this is a company that's grown um, at a rate that, you know, is highly impressive. Quarter after quarter, they've, um, you know, managed to beat expectations, both on top line and bottom line. Um, and they have a long runway ahead of them. If you think about some of the acquisitions they've made, whether it's Instagram or some of the stuff they're doing in the AR space or VR, um, WhatsApp, etc., there's so much, I think, room for this company to grow. And the fact that you can own it today and pay an S&P 500 multiple for it, I think, is an incredible you, you, opportunity. You own a, a sizable yeah, amount of uh, stock? It's the largest holding in my portfolio. Um, have you been a buyer 
uh, on this so pullback, or is it just too I, big to I, do I, that? I, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a large percentage of my own portfolios. Um, I did recently add some um, when uh, this was pre-Cambridge Analytica, um, after their last earnings report, um, the stock fell into the 170s. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And actually, I wrote a piece on Sun Zero about it, pre-Cambridge Analytica, to right, kind of discuss the, the merits. Saw it. Just to discuss the merits of, of Facebook um, as, as an overall business. Um, so, yeah, I would. I mean, I think it's a screaming opportunity. It's almost, it almost trades like a, like Apple did in 2016 as like a value stock, um, like a like a deep value stock. You rarely see these kinds of opportunities to own this much growth at this low multiple. You don't, you don't have any concerns as we as we wrap it up that this thing that this you helped create this yeah. precursor to what became Facebook, this thing that incubated in a dorm room, right. is too powerful? You never think about that? Do you think it is? Um, I'm not sure what too powerful means, but I, I, I think... Um, Does it have too much influence? So it's a I mean, platform, we're, right? We're environment I mean, where we're talking about yeah. fake news, now we're talking about uh, the loss of, of private information. Yep. So if I, if I felt like management was trying to steer Facebook in one direction versus another due to some sort of political bias or some sort of agenda, then yes. But I think they've been very open about the fact that they want to keep Facebook a, um, you know, a, a, a platform for everyone, not just, not just liberals, not just conservatives. And I think what's ironic is that Mark and his team, uh, and like most of Silicon Valley, is liberal by nature. So I think for them, the idea that, you know, okay, they're being accused of swaying an election in favor of, of Trump. Um, is, has got to be surreal, you know, and I think I think that sort of was an eye-opening moment for them, uh, showcasing the, the influence of the platform. But I think the big issue is not, like, whether Facebook can be used for influence, but how is that influence used? And, and again, is the content that people are consuming truthful or not? Um, and that's something that um, kind of comes with the territory, right? When you achieve this type of scale, it, you know, it's 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 one of the challenges that you're going to face very and just naturally. It's a natural byproduct of the size of the community, um, and I think both their tone and kind of the the economics of it, the impact that this story has had on them, is going to force them to make the types of changes that are necessary. Thank you for being here. Absolutely, Absolutely. conversation. Divya Narendra, again, he's the CEO of Sum Zero. Uh, we thank him for being here at Post 9 New York Stock Exchange. Let's remind you one more time as well, 